The challenges and barriers for dual diagnosis for HIV are um, they have do you take a, way more medications when you have the second diagnosis, and there's a lot of dietary changes that need to be made on top of that. So you're having to take on more skills and more doctor's appointments with this new diagnosis. Um, plus exercise and food are some big changes that are hard for people to make. The, um, our, our participants in this study, they talked a lot about that they went to a dietitian, but that they weren't really, really able to make any of the changes that the, they suggested or they thought the changes were silly. Um, some of the participants, we were, did a lot of these interviews in their homes, and so we could tell that their answers didn't always met, match the surroundings. So they would talk about having kind of a healthy small lunch and a healthy small breakfast, but we could see giant boxes of sugary cereals um, and, and uh, sodas and um, candy. A lot, you know, a lot of people just have candy sitting out you know, for guests or for themselves, so they're... Um, and food is comforting to people, so having to change food is, is, is difficult, and the additional appointments is difficult. Um, plus, with diabetes, you have to start testing your blood sugar more, and most of the participants weren't quite willing to do that just yet. Uh, this study was conducted as a, using a mixed method theory, where we used quantitative and qualitative put together so that we could see if what we were finding quantitatively still um, has the patient's voice inside of it. Um, and we found out pretty quickly that the, uh, we were testing a model of self-management to see if we could predict who was more likely to, to adhere to treatment and to self-manage their dual diagnosis, but the model didn't work for people with, who had two conditions. So if you have HIV or you have diabetes, the model works perfectly and we can, we can help you um, adhere and to manage your conditions. But if you have two conditions, the model no longer works and um, there's other factors that are involved in your self-management. And from the interviews, which this was, um, we did 22 qualitative interviews, open, um, open into questions, and we um, asked about different parts of self-management. And um, the, so, so the key findings would be that they, uh, the, big, the, big, the big finding, which isn't very, um, it's not, it's, it's not the most outstanding finding, but it's that social determinants of health are the most important things to this population. If they don't have housing, transportation, um, there's a lot of depression and, um, and um, a lot of the participants experienced intimate partner violence in the past and, and currently. So there's a lot of other issues that we don't normally study in a, in a research. We usually just stick with the big, did you exercise, how are you eating? But we actually need to look beyond that and figure out um, how is, is, do you have stable housing? So most of the participants did not have stable housing. Um, I think those were some of the big findings was that the, um, the people who have HIV and diabetes are experiencing a syndemic, which means two epidemics happening on top of each other, two conditions in the same population. So who they are is actually putting them at risk for both of the conditions. The underlying social issues are what's the major problem. So racism, genderism, sexism, um, poverty, all of these are problems that um, have the end results of having these two conditions. The, one of the big findings was that the people who have HIV and diabetes didn't like their blood exposed to other people, so when they would test their, for their glucose, they were worried about how other people would be perceiving that, and they didn't want their, their blood exposed to other people. Um, we're not going to be able to get, get around not testing blood glucose. That's going to be have to be, we need people testing their glucose. That's the best way to control um, what you're eating and how you're managing your insulin. Um, I think the best way to embrace it is for um, fighting stigma, not just in the population of people who have HIV, but the rest of us realizing that HIV is not a hardy virus and that if you um, did a pinprick, no one would get HIV from a pinprick. Um, and so stigma was, is going to be the best way to combat this. But the, the interesting thing for this person who, that when we talked in the study was, this person didn't want to ever test at work. And so he had to work from home so that he could manage his diabetes better. And so you're further isolating yourself by putting yourself away from all the from other people. So you're being isolated because of this whole blood issue. And the many of the participants talked about 
dirty blood or bad blood and um, none of our blood is dirty none of our blood is bad <laughs> our blood is blood even if it has has a virus in it we all have viruses in our bloods probably right now so I think that would be the one way to think about that this is um, for us to um, be to reduce stigma in the condition the plans for future research are there's so many there's so many ideas and so many things that we need to embrace um, one of the things that I'm super interested in is uh, is symptoms people who have HIV and diabetes together report higher symptoms but they um, report them as less burdensome but when we ask them um, when we ask them about their symptoms they uh, when we prompt them prompted them on their symptoms they were have reported they told us lots and lots of symptoms, way more than they were reporting on a regular scale. So if we asked about, well, you know, how often are you depressed? It would be, it, they were depressed all the time. And how often do you have diarrhea? They had diarrhea several times a week um, from different medications. Or they wouldn't talk about pain, but when we asked them about, you know, your feet or neuropathy, almost everyone experienced neuropathy and had changed their lifestyle due to these symptoms. And so I think developing a better measure for, um, symptom burden in someone who experiences really high levels of symptoms would give a more accurate picture and help us be able to better um, better treat them and improve their their health outcomes if we know how bad they really are because people get used to having a lot of pain and so it stops being it's you stop you normalize it in your own life so that will be one of them another one is building a new model and testing new model to see what is actually important and how can we actually help people um, uh, improve their self-management and uh, the it's probably not just person-based it has to be community and um, and providers and healthcare systems we can't put it all on a person that just isn't going to be feasible and it isn't it isn't going to work so we all we're all gonna have to be in it together helping the whole community be healthier